Alors, le Canada n'a jamais été aussi ouvert et sensible aux enjeux en lien avec la réduction des méfaits liés aux drogues. La période de stagnation de presque dix ans que nous venons de connaître a donné place à un mouvement d'accélération. Certains disent que maintenant, ça va peut-être un peu trop vite. Alors, le monde entier a les yeux tournés vers le Canada. Euh, J'ai l'immense plaisir d'accueillir la ministre de la Santé au Canada. Please welcome the Honorable Jane Philpott. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à tout le monde. Je suis très content d'être ici. Merci. Thank you for all of your uh, efforts to come here, and it's wonderful to see everyone. I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Mohawk, and I want to thank the elder for welcoming us and starting today with prayer, uh, starting the gathering here in a good way. And I want to acknowledge that we still have Mohawk communities here, uh, the Kanasake and the Kanawage communities here near Montreal. Thank you so much for your banners that you're presenting. I see them. I hear you. You know what? I, uh, would you like me to talk? Okay. I will talk, and I hope you will listen. Uh, I am grateful for the opportunity to be here today. I am, have the great honor of being the Federal Minister of Health here in Canada, and I'm honored on behalf of the Prime Minister to welcome you here to this conference. This conference is important. Uh, I don't need to tell you that. It's important for so many reasons. Because of the international reach, because you represent people from 70 countries who have come together, because the issues that you are discussing affect every nation on this planet. And in many ways, it's been already acknowledged that Canada is playing catch up. That we are catching up with countries that have been innovating in the harm reduction space for decades. I am relieved to say, and it has been alluded to already this evening, that as of the fall of 2015, when you last gathered for the International Harm Reduction Conference, Canada has emerged from a decade of aggressive thinking and the propagation of failed approaches to drug policy. During that time, I will be the first to acknowledge that our country ignored innovators in our domestic context, and we shut out some of the most important voices in this discussion. I want to acknowledge the inclusive nature of this gathering, that you have included a range of voices, including even politicians. Thank you for including health professionals, for researchers. Thank you for including the voices of ac activists. Thank you for activists who stand up and share their messages. Thank you for including sex workers, people who use drugs, and many, many more. You may not know that I was a family doctor for 30 years before I became a politician. It's had a huge impact on how I view drug policy. Because when I think about drug policy, I think about patients. I was at a national drug policy forum a few weeks ago, and maybe some of you were there. And I talked at that conference about a patient uh, I, I, will, I don't use patients' real names, obviously, in public. I called her Cynthia. Cynthia was a patient of mine for many years. Cynthia became dependent on opioids due to a range of factors that brought pain to her life. The tragic loss of her own children in a terrible accident when they were young, repetitive sexual abuse at the hands of multiple offenders, chronic unemployment and economic challenges, unstable access to housing. I could also have talked about Kyle and Dean. They were a couple in my practice. They used illicit drugs on an intermittent basis. My conversations about reducing the potential harms of substance use for these men 
were intermingled with the simultaneous need to address the challenges that they were facing with inadequate support from their family, with mental illness, HIV, interactions with the criminal justice system, and many other challenges. I left my clinical practice 18 months ago. I miss my patients. When I think about Cynthia and Kyle and Dean, I wonder how they are. In 2017, in the context that we exist in here in Canada, with an epidemic of overdoses in Canadian cities, it is not sensational to wonder if they are alive. Have they avoided buying a bad batch of drugs? Have they been able to get the compassionate care that they need and deserve? Cynthia and Kyle and Dean were referred to me because of my long interest in HIV primary care. Several of my patients who lived with HIV also used illicit drugs. I learned more from them than almost any other subset of patients. In many cases, their lives were chaotic, their compliance to medication was erratic, their behavior was often unpredictable, but I cared about every one of them very much. Cynthia was smart, she's ambitious, creative, and kind. Kyle and Dean were charming, they were usually cheerful, and they were always grateful. But regardless of my sentiments toward them, they deserve excellent care. They need health and social services, including reducing harms associated with substance use and other behaviors that expose them to health risks. When it comes to drug policy, I am proud to affirm here tonight that our government fully supports harm reduction as a key pillar in that policy. In the face of an unprecedented overdose epidemic, that approach is essential. People like Cynthia, who use opioids every day, and people like Kyle and Dean, whose drug use is intermittent, deserve to live and be well. People who are dependent on opioids and other substances have a health problem. It's often described as addiction. Addiction is not a crime. It is not a moral failing. It is not a bad choice. It is a health problem. The drivers of problematic substance use are well known. They include... I will... Okay, and you know, Lee, I'll be very happy to talk to you later. I hope you're interested in listening to the things I wanted to say, but happy to have that conversation with you. Uh, the drivers of problematic substance use are well known. They include stigma and discrimination. They include poverty and the lack of social supports. They include isolation, rejection, and abandonment. They include abuse of all forms and conflict, sometimes mental illness. Dr. Gabor Maté, who is known to many of you, has eloquently described the stories of patients that he cared for, particularly on the downtown east side of Vancouver. He shares the message that hurt is at the center of all addictive behavior. I want to note as we talk about hurt and unresolved trauma that lies at the core of addiction, that there is one subset in our Canadian population that is disproportionately impacted by psychological trauma, and that is Canada's Indigenous peoples. In Canada, First Nations are significantly more likely to die from alcohol and drug use disorders. So at the root of problematic substance use is those is social issues that I talked about. But in North America, the problem of opioid dependence was exacerbated in the last 20 years by the dramatic rise in opioid prescriptions. That, that rise in prescription drugs was linked to deceptive marketing practices of a pharmaceutical company. But the catalyst that has profoundly impacted the rate of overdoses is the emergence of the fentanyls, fentanyl and its analogs and other high-potency opioids. What is the result? Well, in Canada, 
There were over 500 overdose deaths last year in Alberta, well over 900 overdose deaths in British Columbia. Fentanyl has contributed to deaths in every region of the country. But as you know, it's getting worse. According to the BC Centre on Substance Use, the rate of overdose deaths in that province linked to illegal drugs rose 50% in the first three months of 2017, compared with the same period last year. If trends continue in British Columbia, there will be 1,400 overdoses this year. We don't have all the data for 2016 for Canada, but we know that at a minimum in Canada, there were 2,300 Canadians that died last year of an opioid overdose. The death toll, as Jordan and others have acknowledged, is worse than any other ep infectious epidemic in Canada, including the peak of AIDS deaths since the Spanish flu that took the lives of 50,000 people a century ago. The heart of the response is the theme of your gathering today. And I believe that the heart of the response is equity, is fairness, is recognizing, as uh, uh, others have alluded to tonight, that the response ought to be as impactful, as powerful, as well supported as the response to any other epidemic and any other health cause. One of the most deeply concerning aspects of this crisis, though, which frustrates all of us, is the appalling dearth of data, the glacial pace at which we're getting information that's both timely and accurate. We know that data drives change, and the absence of data allows governments and others to look away. The crisis of overdose deaths is one of the biggest public health challenges that our country is facing, and we can't quantify it. We don't know how many people in Canada are affected by opioid use disorder. We don't know how many people died last year by overdose. There are challenges associated with getting that meaningful data related to opioid use. There are privacy rules. There are information technology gaps. We have feeble public health laws. These are not excuses. We need all stakeholders to come together and provide information to be able to get a complete picture of the experience of opioid users. For the part of the federal government, we've been deploying epidemiologists. We've been working with coroners and medical examiners and public health leaders. We've put together a committee to improve information gathering and improve the evidence base. We still don't have an accurate profile of people who die from overdose in Canada. We need a better understanding of the circumstances in which these deaths occur. Who are the victims? What are the drugs? I'm happy to announce that the Public Health Agency of Canada is going to launch, along with the provinces, an epidemiologic study. This investigation is going to inform where to in we should intervene to have the biggest impact. Data is necessary as a foundation for our work. But as Thomas Edison said, the value of an idea lies in the using of it. So we have to take this data and then compel action. I believe that our actions in response to the epidemic of overdose deaths has to meet four principles. We have to be comprehensive, collaborative, compassionate, and evidence-based. Comprehensiveness means that we don't fool ourselves into thinking that there are simple solutions or that any single law or policy decision is going to change the course of this crisis. A comprehensive response requires all the pillars. I am absolutely, fundamentally, to my core, a supporter of harm reduction. But we will not solve this through harm reduction alone. We need prevention, we need treatment, harm reduction, and there is a role for law enforcement. Canada's previous federal government took out the pillar of harm reduction from their drug strategy. I'm pleased to have put it back in. A comprehensive response includes many steps. One of the first things that I did as health minister, one of the first decisions I made was to change the status of naloxone 
so that it is available in Canada without prescription and in multiple formats. We have granted four uh, approvals for four supervised consumption sites, and we have tabled legislation to support and simplify the process for similar sites. And on Friday, I'm very happy that the final steps were taken so that these two sites in Montreal will be uh, offering services in, in the coming days. And I want to give my tremendous congratulations to Minister Charlebois and her team, and also to the leadership of the municipality, health providers, and many others who made this happen. So the bill that you've heard us talk about tonight is called C-37. It's a piece of le legislation that we introduced in order to streamline the process for applying for and obtaining approvals for supervised consumption sites. The Senate has adopted a, a, a number of amendments. Our government has supported some of them and some we have not. So first of all, and I'm not sure where Jordan is. He seems to have disappeared from there. There you are, Jordan. I keep, thought you were sitting down at the front. I want to clarify to you, our government does support uh, an option for additional consultation at the discretion of the health minister, which would likely only be used in exceptional circumstances. So there is no requirement for an additional consultation period, and I want to make sure that that's well understood. We do not support citizen advisory committees due to the stigma that they may cause. We firmly endorse expanding access to medication-assisted treatment, but we cannot support a mandatory requirement that supervised consumption services have to offer this due to obstacles that it would present for sites and clients. The House of Commons is going to vote on these amendments tomorrow. And then we are going to urge the Senate to pass it quickly through the final stages. And I want to, at this time, give a shout out to my colleague, Minister Chagger, who is our House leader, who worked extremely quickly to turn this around when we got it back from the Senate in less than a week to be able to get the next vote on this. So kudos to the team and the government that are making this possible. We took other steps. We overturned a ban that the previous government had put uh, associated with the evidence-based use of heroin-assisted treatment so that it is now currently available through a special access program. I listened to you. You said that was not enough. And so we have taken steps to fast track a proposal to allow the bulk importation and the use of medications that are, have been authorized in certain other countries but are not yet authorized in Canada to address urgent public health needs. And this will include the ability to import diacetyl morphine, also known as heroin. Nous avons tenu un sommet qui a réuni 42 organisations qui se sont engagées à prendre des actions concrètes pour répondre à cette crise. Cela s'est traduit par uh, 129 engagements distincts d'un éventail d'intervenants qui offrent de l'aide sous, sous tous les angles. Nous avons engagé de nouveaux fonds pour la recherche sur l'utilisation problématique de substances et le traitement. Nous avons investi de nouvelles sommes dans la stratégie canadienne sur les drogues et autres substances, plus de 100 millions de dollars en nouvelles dépenses dans le budget de 2017 pour la nouvelle stratégie canadienne sur les drogues et les autres substances, avec le pilier de la réduction des méfaits réintégrés. So that's a 20% increase to the budget for our strategy. It now sits at close to $700 million to be spent over the next five years. We also provided $16 million in direct emergency funding to Alberta and to British Columbia. And recognizing the links between housing and health, our government's investing $11 billion in housing over the next decade. The National Housing Fund is going to prioritize support for vulnerable citizens, including seniors, survivors of domestic violence, veterans, people with disabilities, people dealing with mental health and addiction. Our budget has also announced the expansion and the reform of the Homelessness Partnership Strategy, funding for housing in the North, for Indigenous peoples, the creation of new affordable housing by making surplus, feder surplus federal lands and buildings available for housing providers at low or no cost. 
We've also offered $5 billion to the provinces and territories to improve access to mental health care, which has obvious links to problematic substance use. Recognizing the need to tackle the inappropriate prescribing of opioids, we funded McMaster University to update the Canadian guidelines for safe and effective use of opioids for chronic non-cancer pain. These updates, which were released this month, were de developed in collaboration with the provinces and territories, their medical regulatory authorities, and they provide, they provide prescribers recommendations on the prescription of opioids. We recognize in a spirit of harm reduction that those guidelines will need to be used cautiously and with great discretion on the part of health providers so as to reduce harms. I also want to note that we passed just last week the Good Samaritan Act, so if it was not already made clear to you that our law now protects people who call 911 in the circumstance of an overdose, that they will not be charged with simple possession of drugs. So none of those steps, and I think that's quite a lot in 18 months, uh, but I recognize that for you it's not enough. We will not fix this overnight but it does not mean that we are not working every single day to, to solve this together. And that brings me to the second principle, that of collaboration. It is critical that all parts of society work together, that we, even we in this room, have a spirit of solidarity. I can't do this alone, and neither can any of you. We have to work together, folks. We need to work respectfully with partners in provincial and municipal governments, with health professionals, with regulators, with educators, with first responders, civil society organizations, and many more. A crisis of this proportion, this is unprecedented, it requires a whole of society response. That includes government, it includes law enforcement. Some uh, who may, until recently, have been seen by you as antagonists or adversaries. And in case it's not abundantly clear, I know that collaboration includes working, governments working alongside people who use drugs. And I hope that it is evident to you uh, and to the people who are most affected by the Canadian overdose crisis that policymakers are listening. We hear your views. We hear your perspectives. I am listening even when your views are critical. I will call you to account if you are inaccurate in your critique and encourage you to be sure that your criticism base is based on the right information. But we have to discover the levers that each of us has and we have to support one another. So I say to you now, especially those of you who have your backs turned to me, I am not your enemy, I am your ally. We know that there are enough anima enemies, and I know that you don't feel that, uh, that pe people are listening, and you're going to have to judge me on that basis, but I tell you that I think about this from the moment I wake up until the time I fall asleep, and I have poured everything I can into this, and I am determined to work with you as your ally to make sure that we bring an end to this overdose crisis. So let me turn to the third principle, and that's compassion. Nous avons beaucoup de travail à faire en matière de compassion. Je n'ai pas besoin de dire à cet auditoire que les gens qui ont des dépendances aux substances font souvent l'objet de stigmatisation et de discrimination. Je ne suis pas sûr qu'il y ait autre problème de santé uh, dont les gens atteignent uh, sont plus susceptibles d'être blâmés, maltraités et se voient refuser des soins que le problème de la dépendance aux substances. Ceci est bien sûr non seulement d'aucune aide, mais cruel. Beaucoup de Canadiens trouvent qu'il est facile de juger et difficile de compatir avec ceux qui amènent les gens à la dépendance aux drogues alors que tous les membres de la société ont l'obligation de traiter ceux qui ont des problèmes de dépendance aux opioïdes avec compassion, dignité et respect. Il faut dire que les professionnels de la santé ont une obligation claire à cet égard 
et qu'il y a certainement place à l'amélioration. We do, not object, we do not accept discrimination on the basis of people's skin color, their sex, their gender, their religion. We reject shaming people for obesity, yet in some sectors, as has been said tonight, it's still acceptable to blame addiction on poor decision making. We need to accept that the right to harm reduction is one that is shared by people who live in the downtown east side of Vancouver as much as it is by teenagers buying counterfeit Percocets in the suburbs of Ottawa. When we say that drug policy has to be compassionate, it means recognizing the unresolved, that unresolved pain rests at the core of problematic substance use, and this has many implications. It means that appropriate treatment must include emotional care, counseling, and social supports. It means that there's a great deal of work to be done in the area of prevention, to build a society where fewer people face abandonment and isolation, where emotional trauma is recognized and treated as a factor, a risk factor for further suffering. And so that brings me to the final principle on drug policy, is that it must be evidence-based. Quite simply, we have to look at what works and what doesn't, and then we need to do what works. And so let me begin with the federal role in research as a critical component for our strategy to address problematic substance use. Through the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, the gov federal government established the Canadian Research Initiative on Substance Misuse. This is a network of national, it's a national research platform on addiction and funding to this Funding for CRISM has uh, produced the evidence-based guidelines for the management uh, of opioid use disorder in British Columbia. Our most recent federal budget added an additional $10 million to the work of CRISM, and researchers are now expanding uh, the work that's been done in British Columbia to produce guidelines on how to best address the problematic use of opioids at a national level. When I look at the abstracts for your conference, it fills me with hope. You're challenging orthodoxy. You're experimenting with new approaches. In fact, many significant advances in dealing with this problem have come from that kind of work. Many of you are familiar with the Salome and Naomi trials, the first trials of heroin-assisted therapy in North America done here in Canada. We owe a debt of gratitude to the researchers, health professionals, and others who did this work in the context of a fair amount of suspicion from the government of the day. But it's research like this that pushes the boundaries so that we know that heroin-assisted therapy is a useful tool for some individuals with problematic substance use where other treatment options have failed. We know from other research in this area that for some individuals, physician-supervised heroin injections are the only alternative to street heroin. This can help not only uh, in these individuals by reducing bloodborne infections, reducing the possibility of a contaminated drug supply, but the general population is also helped by lowering rates of drug-related crime, lower health care costs, and moreover, it keeps people alive. Not to mention that the cost of treating people at a clinic like Crosstown uh, can be done for $25,000 a year, providing social supports and medication, compared to an estimated cost of $47,000 per year, factoring in the cost of emergency care, law enforcement, and other services. When we look at what works, we need to look not only at patient-level interactions, but health system strategies as well. We learn from countries like Switzerland, whose approach in, the, uh, in a single decade led to a 50% decrease in drug-related deaths and a 90% reduction in property crime. We can also look to Portugal, where there has been tremendous success in reducing stigma and discrimination uh, associated with drug use by emphasizing, as you are doing, the inalienable human dignity and value of all citizens. They brought together experts in medicine, law, social workers, people with lived experience, and have found solutions that work for drug users. They provide people who use drugs with treatment options and low barriers so that individuals don't put themselves at further risks. And we owe it to all our citizens to see what we can learn from those examples and how those principles can be adapted to our own society. So on June 22nd, just over a month from now, I have asked the Canadian Institutes of Health Research 
to host a knowledge exchange event, to learn how other jurisdictions have addressed problematic substance use, and to look at the feasibility of implementing similar legal and policy frameworks here in Canada. This will support our commitment to evidence-informed policies, and we will ensure that policymakers are present to learn from that evidence. Nous avons le devoir de prendre en considération ce que l'histoire et la science nous enseignent. Les gens qui ont une utilisation problématique des substances, comme ceux qui souffrent de tout problème de santé, devraient avoir l'accès à d'excellents soins de santé. Ceci devrait inclure l'accès au traitement, euh, euh, l'éventail complet d'options de traitement devrait inclure toute forme de traitement au moyen de médicaments. Ceci veut dire que les traitements de substitution aux opioïdes et le cas échéant des injections supervisées d'héroïne de qualité pharmaceutique devraient être parmi les traitements offerts. A paradigm shift in drug policy takes time, but it will take a lot longer if we don't talk about it together, openly, and discuss opportunities for how we can improve our approach, if it could save lives and have multiple social benefits. The topic of drug policy remains politically and emotionally charged and open to controversy. But that must not deter us from an ambitious approach to finding and implementing solutions. So let me end by going back to think about Cynthia, Kyle, and Dean. How could I have provided better care for them? How could we avoid the cost to our healthcare system for caring for someone like Cynthia, including the costly medications required for bloodborne infections, hospitalizations for conditions from overdose to endocarditis to osteomyelitis. How can we help Cynthia and others like her adapt from a life of what seems at times like perpetual chaos, violence, and pain into a life that is predictable, peaceful, and productive? The response has to be comprehensive. It is going to require all of us collaborating it demands a whole of society response and a lens of compassion. We must all commit to an evidence-based approach, even when the evidence points to measures that appear daunting to implement. I want to thank you for your commitment to this matter. I want to assure you of my utmost dedication as long as I have the tremendous honor to serve in this capacity. I look forward to working with you, to helping you to save lives, to meet the goal of justice, health, and dignity for all. You have said that this is about the heart of the response. For me, the heart of the response is equity. We need to recognize that all people are people, including people who use drugs. And in that spirit, I urge you to continue your work, to be creative, be bold, and most of all, be kind. Thank you. Thank you very much.